We're still in the Sermon on the Mount. Beatitude, Sermon on the Mount, long, long sermon. I'm not going through the whole thing. I said I'd just go through and go where the Lord leads me. But Jesus is still on the mountain. Um, he's gone through the teaching, if you remember, the law and the prophets of, of how, how the law is truly fulfilled by getting to the motives of it, right? And that's what I'm skipping over. You can go back and read it for yourself, but it's not about murdering. It's about the motive that happened before murdering, right? It's not about the, it's about what happens before the, the act of adultery because it already happened in your heart, those kinds of things. So he goes through that, just dealing with the heart of the law for these Jewish Christians mainly. He warns about hypocrisy. Hypocrisy in, in, in fasting and giving and, and, and praying in order to be seen in chapter 6. Then he teaches the famous Lord's Prayer that we all know, which was never meant to be a rote, you say the Lord's Prayer and you prayed right today, you got a blessing. Um, it was meant to give an example of we pray in this way, and then you look at the aspects of it, and we could do a whole breakdown of that. Uh, it'll tie into today's message. So we're in chapter 6 now. And around verse 19, Jesus begins to warn against the danger of riches and materialism and greed. And that's because back then, with the, with the Jews, the, the religious... They had a similar problem to what we have today. They would use religion to get prosperity and riches and wealth. They would manipulate that somehow to make themselves profit off of it. Nothing wrong with wealth per se. It's not condemned by Jesus, but it's condemned when it becomes our master. Because we cannot serve God. And there's that famous verse, we can't serve God and mammon. So through all these, these teachings, what Jesus is doing is getting our focus off of the physical and onto the spiritual. The spiritual is most important. The spiritual is most important. The physical will not last. The entire system that we live in is constantly, the world system is constantly vying, pulling for our attention to get it focused on only the physical world, on only material things. So materialism. I don't know what you think of when you think of materialism. Maybe you think of shopping. Maybe you think of uh, somebody who's like a hoarder, right? And they just got to have a lot of stuff to make them comfortable. But there's a deeper meaning. There's a philosophical definition of materialism. It's believing that matter, anything you can touch, is the most important substance in nature and all things, even our mental state, even our consciousness, are results of physical interactions, material interactions. In other words, all that exists is only physical. So do you see, do you see the danger in that philosophy with our faith? It denies the spiritual. And the furthest extent of it. It's denying the spiritual world, so it's denying God. There's no room for the supernatural. There's no room for healing. And then we become dependent on what we see, on what we feel, 
and what we can touch, and of course what we can physically possess, because that's all that matters. All of it opposes faith in God, and all of it we are thrown into this world that's corrupted by sin and a system that is out to get us to believe that what is in front of us is all there is. Jesus knew the problems that this will cause, that it has caused for us, because our physical lives become so important that we become overly, overly concerned about the physical. And as believers, we can forget who is really taking care of us because we ought to know if we're believers. So out of that, out of that teaching and uh, materialism, we come to our today's text, which is uh, Matthew 6.25. Here we go. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life what you will eat or drink or about your body or what you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes look at the birds of the air they do not sow or reap or store away in barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them are you not much more valuable than they can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life and why do you worry about clothes See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here tomorrow, here today and gone tomorrow, or thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans, or the Gentiles, run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. We started with therefore. So out of that therefore, what, or some of your translations say, for this reason I say to you, that means that what is about to be said is a conclusion of what Jesus was just talking about. So since you cannot serve God and money, followers of Jesus Christ should not be absorbed with concerns for material things. Got that. But we should trust God for what we need. The right way to view all of our possessions as believers means that we recognize Jesus as master. So the command, and it is a command, do not worry, is flowing out of this. Now, some of our translations say, do not be anxious, right? Now, I understand the meaning of that, but I'm, I'm using the word worry this morning and out of a translation that uses worry because of the connotations, the associations we have in our 2024 society with the term anxiety or anxiousness. And I'll explain. Let's start by defining worry or anxiousness in, in this context. Well, first, I'll tell you what it's not, biblically. Worry in, in, this, in this section of scripture, worry is not an anxiety <coughs> disorder. It's not a mental or a chemical misregulation. We live in a fallen world corrupted by sin. And sometimes 
people have uncontrolled, unprovoked panic attacks that requires both prayer and medical attention. Are you tracking with me? When, when you call that, when you call an anxiety attack, and I'll just be, of course, transparent, right? Um, my wife occasionally will have this. It comes out of nowhere. It's just, it's, it's, not, it's not anything she chose to do or just came. When you call, when it's a, an anxiety disorder, when you call that sinful, which Christians have been known to do, you're, that's the same thing as saying when an epileptic has a seizure, that seizure is sinful. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that's for those of us, me included, who were once falsely taught in our Christian lives that every time you have anxiety or depression or these things, it is a sin somehow. We have to just, if we're interpreting the Bible and we're reading in context, that's, that's false. It's a lie. But there's that verse that says anything that's not of faith is sin. If you're going to quote that verse, go back and tell me the context. What is Paul talking about? Food sacrificed to idols and things that violate your conscience. If it's violating your conviction, I think it's bad to eat non-kosher, drink non-kosher water. I just violated my conscience. If I, I, can't, I can't do that in faith, that, that's a sin to me. So those are, it's little things that we, t- we mess up in Christianity. And then your friend has an anxiety attack, and it's a real one, right? And you're like, oh, well, you're, you're, you're living in sin. And your friend's like, what? I didn't, I didn't want this. It just came. I don't even know where it came from. So this is not that kind of anxiety. And many of us will say, well, anxiety is overdiagnosed today, overprescribed. Okay. Everything's just over everything right now. The world is just, we're reaching a point where it's all increasing. So. What else is not this kind of anxiety? Oh, caused by distress or suffering. When you have distress or suffering, you're going to have some kind of reaction. God made us that way. Perhaps just to turn to him if it's for that reason. If you think you're not going to go through any anxiety when you're, you know, being attacked or anything like that, um, and you think that's a sin, that's, that's, that's a mistake also. It's part of life. I use Job as an example. Jeremiah, uh, Nehemiah, David. You read the writings of David, and if I had a DSM whatever for diagnosis manual, this guy would have a lot of mental issues. <laughs> How about Mary and Joseph? They were looking for Jesus, and it says they were they caused. They, were, they had anxiety because they couldn't find their son. You better have anxiety if your kid is lost. That's normal. Jesus himself in the garden experienced these things. The, the, oh, please take this cup from me, but your will be done. Never I'm so it's not that kind of anxiety. That's why I'm calling it worry mainly this morning. And this is uh, the uh, marimna in the Greek, and it means to take thought from a a root word meaning a care that brings disruption to the personality and mind. Now the key there is I said it is a care. It's something that you cared about that caused a disruption to your personality and mind. Literally translated, it means to be drawn in different directions in your mind. So worrying like this, what Jesus is talking about, it's something that we willingly choose to enter into. We take the thought and we turn away from trusting God. Okay, worrying for what? 
What are we worrying about? Well, Jesus tells us. This is the context. It says, don't worry about your life. What does that mean? It means your everyday condition or state of being alive, especially related to your health and nourishment and the things that you need to live on a daily basis, we will call that this morning provision. Being provided for to live in your life. So we can't worry about that. Does this mean we can't plan for the future? No, it doesn't mean that. Preparing for the future is not the same thing about, as being worried about it so anxiously and you're divided about it and you can't focus on what is important. We're commanded in the Bible to provide for our families and, and work and all that. To care about others. But Jesus says, life is more than food or clothes because our existence is not limited to food and clothes. God gave us life do you think that he's not going to provide for us? Worrying about running out of whatever or not having enough, our basic needs is forsaking trusting God when you worry about that stuff. That's starting with what Jesus is saying. And in our Western world, in America, we have worry as a plague. And you cannot medicate away worry. You can't even diagnose this kind of worry. This is something that has to be dealt with with a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we live in one of the most food-consuming, clothes-buying societies in the world. As far as hunger we are not going to be on the list of the most hungry, hungriest places on earth. We're so unimportant to hunger, they just blocked us out up there. Because we're like, well, not America, but these guys, yeah, they got hunger problems. Now, I know there's people truly hungry, okay? I know that. I'm being sensitive. I, I get calls every week. But often the people that call, you know what the reality is? They're just worried. They're worried about running out. They're worried, sadly, they're worried about running out of their specific preference. You know, the creamy chicken ramen noodles, not the beef one. I prefer creamy chicken, but that's me. And my goal in, is not, oh, yeah, well, let me, you must be really hungry. I, I want to I address that worry and that panic issue and introduce them to Jesus, God, their provider, so they can understand this. So. Now, there, there are people who are legitimately starving, even in America, but few of us looking around the room have legitimately, uh, I'm not calling you overweight. Okay, chill out. How, what, who has actually um, experienced the crisis of actually starving for weeks and, and weeks to the point where you're worrying about if you're going to die or not because you haven't eaten? But we do know what we can all relate to. We know what it's like to worry about running out of stuff, don't we? And, and we can fall into worrying need, need, needlessly. And we saw the epitome of this back in 2020, didn't we? You remember that? Have mercy, life is more than toilet paper. And if you run out, God has provided leaves in abundance. We have to trust God's provision, which actually means, provision means, if you look at the pro and you break down the word, he's provided in advance. Yeah. He's looked ahead and provided for you. Remember Paul, Paul's on house arrest, and he's declaring the same things Jesus is teaching, obviously, because he learned from Jesus. So 
on house arrest. I know it probably wasn't as hard as Clay County Jail, perhaps, you know, maybe he had some comforts, but it was still pretty hard. And he's experienced worse than that. But he says, Philippians 4, 19, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Next, Jesus goes into using nature as an example. And he says, look at the birds. Look at how God takes care of the animals. Have you ever just looked at animals and be like, look how God takes care of them. God gives us these things in creation. Um, have you ever looked at the, you guys have rabbits everywhere. Are they called rabbits or bunnies? These things, are they cottontail? Every time I pull up to my driveway in the alley, even when it's negative 15, I see this rabbit hopping across. I'm like, how do these things even live in this cold? Because God provides. How do they eat vegetation in the winter? Lower bark, and they, they eat twigs. I, I researched it, and they, they eat their own feces, which is gross, but God, God provides. So they're not freaking out, wondering where their, their meal is going to come from. Neither are the birds. Now, they still have to work to go get it, but it's there, and God's going to provide and aren't we more, worth more than the animals? We forget how much value we have as human beings. The word for worth or value in whatever translation you're using, it means to be superior. So human life is superior to animals. Superior. God values us. Even pagans back in the day, in the ancient day, would have understood this. Like, oh yeah, well... Humans are more important than, I don't know, uh, elephant bird eggs or an endangered species. But, yeah, that one was $26,000. I don't even know if that's real, but I found it. But we live in such an ungodly culture, a rare whatever that egg was or a uh, you know, these sea turtle eggs, the endangered ones, they're, they're of more value than a human embryo. We value endangered species more. We'll protect that life, but not what God values most of all, and that's human life. Human life is most valued by God. And you could call that a pro-life statement. I have no problem with that. It's a, it's a Bible statement. Amen. We have to value humans. Your life, he cares about you more than you can imagine. He loves you. He died for it. He didn't die for the bunnies. If he takes care of these animals, it's an assault on his nature and character to worry about him not meeting your most basic needs. Later on in Matthew 10, 29, it says, but even the hairs on your head are counted. So don't fear, you're more valuable than a great number of sparrows. And then we get that Great him off of that, right? So why do we worry then? Why, 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 why? What's the purpose of it? Jesus answers that question. It does nothing. Absolutely nothing. It actually hurts us. It grieves God. Jesus says in 627, can any of you, by worrying, add an hour to your life? Now some of your translations say cubit or inch, but it, it's talking about lifespan, time. Can worrying make us live longer? Well, that sounds dumb um, because it is. It, it actually shortens your lifespan. Science proves this, what God already warns us about. How you react to situations today can affect your health 10 years down the road. Me being consumed with worry, especially about the things I used to worry about before I knew Christ, I could have a heart attack waiting for me 10 years down the road physically because of the toll, overreacting and worrying constantly. It reduces, proven to reduce life expectancy. So I could say it brings death. And death is, that's what we're worried about most of all. You may say you're not, 
But somewhere in there, every fear response, every worried response that you have about anything, it's rooted in the fear that we have of dying that we've had since the fall. Our lives are in his hands. The day you were born, in his hands. The day you die, in his hands. And the problem with the latter is that we don't know when that's going to happen, and that freaks us out because we like to be in control, and we want to know. Worrying about it does nothing. Worry changes nothing. Trusting God changes everything. Verse 28, Jesus goes back to the nature illustration. Again, this time he says, why are you worried about clothing? I don't think any of us are worried about clothing this morning. Or perhaps you are. He says, Look at the flowers in, in, in nature, right? The lilies actually means any wildflowers that were growing at that time. Have you actually stopped and looked at flowers? Well, we can't do that now, but when it's, when it's warm, I'll be honest, I don't really look at flowers too much. I buy my wife flowers sometimes when she's mad at me. No, uh, on a birthday or anniversary. Um, <laughs> But have you looked? I looked up the most beautiful flowers. Look at that. I forgot what it's called, but that, that's for real. That's a real flower. That is a, is that a Lilith something? I don't know. You botanists may know about it. Wow. Look at, what is that? This is amazing. Basically, Jesus is saying, look at this. Look what I did. They're dressed better than Kate Middleton. They look better than your favorite Prada purse or your fake Prada purse. <laughs> They're more attractive than a red Stanley cup. Better than Solomon's richest robes. You go to First Kings or you go to the Old Testament for that. He was really rich. God put all this work and, and thought and creative power into plants. Now, plants can react, but they don't actually have a brain. They're not actually self-aware. Things that aren't self-aware, do you think he's not going to put a greater effort into caring for you? when he does so for something that's destroyed the next day, in, in many cases, burning up grass, using that example. So now Matthew 6.30, and we're going right through to get to the, the climax, but Jesus says, you of little faith. How many of you, we've, we've heard this before. So this phrase that Jesus is using, keep in mind, when he uses it in other places also, he's using it at times when the disciples are doubting God's ability to take care of them. That is what that is meaning there. Uh, Matthew 8, 26, 14, 31, 16, 8. That is what these faith rebukes are about. When we say little and we put it with faith, it's doubting his ability or his authority. It's not that this measuring thing where you just had a little bit like this. No, it's that you're not trusting in his a lot. You're not trusting in his complete power. 631, Jesus is getting close to the end of this section because he goes into judging right after this. I don't know if how the sermon was broken up. I know he was sitting up there on a mountain. Uh, he probably maybe took a break. I don't know. He's Jesus. He does he need a break? I don't know. Well, whatever. But there are sections. And he says in 631, do not worry about these things. What things? Physical, life, 
your whole life needs provision. And he says, Gentiles, Gentiles eagerly seek these things. Non-Jewish people or pagans. So pagans seek after these things. So people who are not converted, not saved, are occupied all the time in their minds because they're not kingdom-minded. And we are not supposed to worry like that anymore in Christ. Stuff, even our most basic needs and being cared for, being taken care of, cannot be the thing that we seek the most. The world, when they see that, when they see you not stocking up on a mass amount of toilet paper, they're going to think you're strange, that you're not panicking. I was at Walmart yesterday. They're like, they're out of fruit right now for some reason. They're out of a lot of things. I came home and told Megan, I'm like, what's happening? Is, I'm, I didn't watch the news this week, so is, is there another COVID thing going on? Because Walmart's out of stuff. But I didn't freak out because my kids wanted blueberries. I just got them raspberries. It's not a big deal. Um, the world is going to think you're crazy that you're not, why are you not freaking out right now? Why are you not worried about what's about to happen? That's what the Bible says. They're going to think it's strange or they're going to be surprised that you no longer live for those desires anymore of what used to control you when you spent your whole life in, in, in worry. 1 Peter 4, 3, for the time already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of indecent behavior, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and wanton idolatries. In all this, they're surprised that you do not run with them in the same excess. And that includes the idol of worry and running after the material things of this world. Because uh, as an unbeliever, you're living by your own resources, you're living in your own strength, you're doing things on your own, because in a sense you are on your own. But in Christ, we have God's resources all the time. We have his care, we have his providence, we have a God who loves us. Pagans do not trust in God, but themselves. And until recently, I, I thought about the term seeker-friendly church, right? That, that term seekers are coming in here. I don't agree with that. It depends on what it means. Because when, I, when, when you're not a believer, you are not seeking after the things of God. Because you don't know the things of God. You become a seeker when you get to know God. So if you call them seeker like, well, I'm seeking the meaning of life, I'll, I'll go with that, but they're seeking after anything else. And the Bible actually proves that because no one seeks after God, the Bible says. Romans 3.10, there's no righteous person, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks out God. But seeking changes when we come to Jesus, doesn't it? Your appetites, your desires. So verse 33 of Matthew 6, here it is. It's the climax, and some will call this the most important verse of the entire Sermon on the Mount. This discourse, remember we have five, and this is just the first one. In verse 33, we have the cure. So if you're worried this morning about something, this is the cure. Matthew 6, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well or added to you. Let's break it down. Seek first. Let's deal with the first because that's very important. First does not mean uh, chronological. First doesn't mean, okay, I'm going to seek the kingdom first, and then second, I'm going to seek after food, and then third, I'm going to seek after clothes. 
If you translate first, it is make it your priority more than anything else. It's not chronological, it's value, it's priority. It's the thing you should most want in your heart, the kingdom. What is the kingdom? His dominion, his rule and reign, his work and purpose, his will and his glory. It connects to the Lord's Prayer earlier in this chapter. It says, Matthew 6.10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's why that prayer is important because it's getting our priorities right. We're seeking the kingdom. If seeking his kingdom is our priority and what we're above all striving for, then all other striving in your life is going to cease or the volume is going to be turned down Because you know those needs are going to be taken care of in your life. It means participating in his kingdom while you're on earth. In an effort to bring others to Christ. Glorifying him in our concerns. Not denying him by our worrying all the time. He will take care of everything you really need. Hmm. When we worry about when we worry about God taking care of us, I don't know. Oh, think like a parent. It's like it's like my six year old refusing to come down for dinner because he's worried about dinner not being on the table. I mean, that sounds ridiculous to me, right? Like he knows. He just trusts me. He knows I'm going to come down. Dinner's going to be there. He's not upstairs. Is he going to feed me tonight? I don't know. I. I mean, he, he said he would, but I'm not sure. I, I can't trust him. And think about it. If my six-year-old told me that, my heart, I mean, it happened with my 13-year-old the other day because she, she's not in here, right? <laughs> she can be a challenge for me. I love her to death, but she asked me something or she asked mom something, and I'm like, well, why don't you ask me? I know about that. And she's like, I don't know if you do. I'm, do you not trust me? I'm your dad. And it hurt. I was offended. I should be offended. That's my daughter. I want her to trust me in everything. Certain things I want her to ask her mom because I don't want to go there. But <laughs> it would hurt. Imagine how God feels when he sees you thinking that, well, he's not going to provide for me. Or he can't do this. He's a good father. So, seek first the kingdom. Finally, verse 34 of chapter 6. He goes to that point, and then he's going to go beyond all the needs. Food, clothing, everything. This is awesome. He says, do not worry about tomorrow. That's a big one. Now we can care about the future. There's nothing wrong with that, of course. Prepare for it. Make your schedules. We got schedules, plans. We got plans, budgets, build. But we're never to do that in anxiousness and fear. The past, you can't, you can't change the past senseless to worry about it. That sounds logical. We know this already. People who live in the past, are you're living in bondage in some point or some area. You just need to be free of it. But the reality is if you're living in the past, Jesus says you can't wholly follow him. Uh, Luke 9.62. Not even fit to be a disciple you got to get free of that before you're wholly dedicated to him. It's the same with our future. Worrying about, when I worry about the future problems, something that has not happened yet, it's going to paralyze the ability that we have to handle the day that we have, which is right now, it's today. Jesus says, each day has its own trouble. 
The kakia in the Greek sounds bad because it is. It, it means affliction. So right there, against a gospel that tells you it's all going to be great, you're not going to have trouble, Jesus is saying, no, every day is going to have some kind of trouble. Actually, he's saying affliction of its own in a day. So God's giving us what we need to handle the day. No one can, ha no one can handle the burden of the day that we're in, a burden of a day, while worrying about the future and fully trust in God for that day. Because all we have right now is one day, one day at a time. That's not just for recovery people. That's for all of, all of y'all, everybody. One day at a time, each day to glorify God in faith Trusting him to provide for you, to care for you, to love you, to hear his voice. We see this today, this theme all through the Bible, uh, Hebrews 3, 7, quoted out of the Old Testament. So as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness. Then the Bible says his provision for us and his mercy for us, which is the cause of his provision, is new every single day. Lamentations 3.22, the Lord's acts of mercy indeed do not end, for his compassions do not fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Now, Look at verse 22. Mercy does not end. Okay, that means eternal. And then verse 23, they're new every morning. So we're connecting the eternal to the daily. Every day, we have his, because of his mercy, the opportunity to glorify God with our lives. And part of how you glorify God is you trust him. When you do that, you're going to reflect his image to the world and your situation. Now, what if you only had one day to live? One day. Just, that's it. That's your lifespan. Believers. And I know I can relate to unbelievers because I used to be one too, just like all of us. If you had one day to live as a Christian, would you honestly spend it staring at your screen all day? One day. That's it. That's your lifespan. Would you spend it worrying about things you don't have? It's a good question. Would you spend it seeking out your bucket list? All the things that you want to do? Or pleasure, or need, or your needs. How about entertainment? Would you binge watch that show? That's an incredible waste of time because if it's 24 hours and you sleep, I don't know, eight hours, what a waste of time. Would you eat every decadent dish that you could find? Would you party like it's 1999? <laughs> Remember that? Um, not a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because you know, you should know that you were bought with a great price. And your life is so, so much more valuable than slipping away into the vain things of the world for that one day that you have to be alive. So I believe that everyone, if you know Jesus, you would seek what you can do in that span of time for the glory of God. Every hour, every minute. The people to reach. That should be our desire. And that would be visible to everyone in that one day that we had to live. There's a there's another flower that I found in creation 
that kind of exemplifies this. Every single day, this flower does this. It's called the morning glory. Some of you know about it. I didn't know about it until I studied about it. Each flower, and the time lapse will run as I'm speaking, each of these flowers that you see up there, it only lives for one day. That's it. It blooms in that day. Actually, I think it's a few hours. It displays the glory it's supposed to, and then it dies. A new flower comes, and you'll see it if you're paying attention. That one withered and died, and then there comes another one. So if you catch one open, you're blessed, and that's a special thing because you're seeing a flower that you're only going to see for that day. The next day, it's going to be an entirely different flower. That's all. There's no tomorrow for it, for that flower. It's not going to exist. There's going to be a whole other new one. All morning glories do for their entire life in a day is reflect the glory of God, showing his design, his, his providence, the, the beauty of the color and all this. If you think flowers evolve from something, that's insane. God just like, I'm going to dress you like that, and you're just like that. It's awesome. Now, considering that, a flower with a, a lifespan of just hours, he put all that purpose into that. Do you think that he does not have purpose for you in your life every single day? You won't know if you're wasting it worrying about what you have or what you don't have or what may not ever be. You have to trust him for today. And then when tomorrow comes, you trust him for tomorrow. You can't force yourself to already trust him tomorrow. It just doesn't work that way. There is glory in every single day that we're given. And you can know this by seeking first the kingdom of God. I think of, I think it's kind of like Groundhog Day to me with Bill Murray, that, that movie from back in the, back in the day. Um, you, you get the chance to get it right every single day, over and over and over again. Of course, that's a secular sphere. I'm talking about the spiritual, the Christian sphere, and we have the chance every day to seek his kingdom, and for the time being, we may get a tomorrow. One day there will be no tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen. When you get to heaven, when, you, when, it, when it's done, time stops. You have to wrap your head around this. It's eternity. There's no more seconds passing. There's nothing ending. There's nothing beginning. It's like a constant a constant eternal moment in the presence of God that you just get to be in the midst of. I, that's the best way I can describe it. I can't. My mind's blown because we live in time. There'll be nothing to worry about because there's going to be no time to run out. Everyone's out of time right now. There's people thinking, it's 1130. He's going to stop or what? This is, I got to go. Time, time, time. It, it rules us. It's not like that. We'll be living in a constant, unending glory that will never end. That's what eternity is all about. So don't worry. Don't let your anxious thoughts rob you of the glory of God in your life. Whatever you need today, the Father is ready and willing to supply. Exactly what you need. Do you trust him for that? Have you been worried about something? Would you close your eyes this morning? Thank you, Lord.
Holy Spirit. Father, I pray as you're touching hearts this morning. I pray for fears, Lord, for anxious thoughts by the authority, God, of, of your spirit, of your power, God, that we would recognize that and submit, God, realizing that you are taking care of every need in this place. Future, provision, providence, purpose. Thank you, Lord. Healing. Anything that a good father would give his children is provided for because of what Jesus did for you. And this morning, you are simply here for Jesus to tell you, do not worry. So in your mind, in your heart, that's your job to do, is lean in and seek the kingdom and see how you can glorify God today. So Father, we give our hearts to you this morning. We ask you, Lord, forgive us for the areas where we've gone overboard, where we've lost control in our thoughts, when all the time we should be trusting you. Help us, God, as finite humans to think in eternal terms and enter into that eternity already, Lord, realizing that our purpose is just to glorify you. God, I pray for new purpose, for new strength in people who are plagued by worry this morning. Fear of death in Jesus' name. Fear of loss, sadness, grief, whatever it is. Finances. We pray for your provision, Lord, and we trust you. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Listen, if you have a, we're going to dismiss because the kids' services are here. We want to, we want to, sometimes it's not easy to do what we're talking about. So we're going to stay up here and pray. Some of the prayer team, please just come up because there's people who still need prayer up here. We want to pray and agree with you here and uh, pray for your mind and for those things to be released. Everyone else, you're dismissed. Have a good day. We'll stay up here and pray for you.